pleasure to be kicking off the, the second day of DeepSec. I heard there was already a lot of, a lot of good content on, on GSM and other topics yesterday. Um, hopefully we can continue in the same, at the same pace. Um, GSM is under attack, very clearly so, um, which is a good thing. It's the first step towards the next, next iteration of an evolution that's long overdue. A 20-year-old technology that security-wise hasn't been revised at all for those 20 years, um, and that has been in the same time period, though spread to pretty much every corner of, of this planet. Five billion active GSM lines currently, all um, poorly secured. Um, I'm here today with the fabulous Dieter Spahr, um, in his own right, an, an expert on everything RF and um, contributor to, to several GSM projects, open source projects, that is. Um, and we today don't want to focus on attack so much, but rather on analysis tools, giving you the tools to create the next attacks. Over the past year, um, we have been, though, working on an attack, and um, this attack was specifically on GSM's encryption. Um, cryptographically interesting, but perhaps not the only thing you can be attacking within GSM. Um, so all the results um, we, we built today were primarily um, meant to create data so we can launch our cryptographic attacks. However, those very same tools today are available to you, open source, to play around with GSM for whatever analysis you can think of. Um, so this is a talk on, on tools and how to generate the data on GSM that you are used to seeing on, say, your normal network anyway, right? Perhaps as a, as a little teaser up front um, and a uh, little backward looking history over the past year. Um, the GSMA challenged us about a year ago saying, even if you guys can decrypt our phone calls, you can't record them, right? Which was a true statement back then. We were very much focusing on encryption because uh, previously those GSM guys told us that encryption is what makes the system secure. Now, when we were getting close to breaking that, they suddenly thought something else was what made their system secure. So the GSMA and a um, large number of, of operators uh, within the GSMA um, believe that the, the hardest problem in intercepting calls and listening to your neighbor's phone calls and text message is not decrypting it once it's on your computer, but rather getting it onto your computer from the air. Before explaining why this is a hard problem, let me try to, to demonstrate what, what has happened over this past year. Um, if time permits, I'll in the end show um, how keys are actually being, being cracked and all that. But let's assume for now that we have a, um, that we have a system to, um, to decrypt keys. And let's assume we've already cracked the, the key that that, that our neighbor is currently using on GSM. These keys are being recycled for several, um, for several um, iterations, for several text messages, calls, or what have you. So it's a fair assumption that once you have the, um, once you have the capability of cracking a key, you, you know that key. Um, for legal reasons, we, we have to make this assumption here for a live demonstration, because we're not, not allowed to capture anything off the air that's not specifically meant for our phone to receive. So um, I'm, I'll, I'll apply a filter here that um, filters out everything that, that this phone couldn't be decrypting. And then I think, statistic, just statistically speaking, it's pretty much impossible that another phone on this cell uses the same encryption key at the same time. So we should be, um, oops, we should be safe when making this assumption. Um, the tools I'm using here are from a suite called AirProbe. Um, a fairly old idea by now. Um, and, and a suite of tools that, have been, that has been um, 
growing and being improving over the last years, and um, that today will, will, will make its next evolutionary step. Um, not the part I'm demonstrating now, oops, that last part was too much. So sorry, I couldn't prepare this, but this this key does does change, maybe once an hour. Or so, um, six two one five two C looks good. Um, so what I'm what I'm using is is the the here in this space here. It's a it's called the universal um, software programmable radio. You, software radio peripheral, same, same letters in a different order. Um, so it's, it's what the name suggests, a radio that can be programmed to do pretty much anything RF. And in this case, will be programmed to capture data from one tiny chunk of spectrum where GSM operates and spit it out into the computer. And the computer does the rest in software. I have to do a little hack here. Um, you, you saw the, the, the bash file. I, I keep restarting this program because the, the actual live capture gets stuck on some, some data. Um, and then, um, then, then it, it, it has to be restarted. So um, if, if anybody dares to, to send me a text message to this number. Can you read this? I'd appreciate if, if a couple of people uh, could, could, be, could be sending text message to this now. And let me, let me verify that the key hasn't changed. No, that's still the key. <coughs> Now the key did change. <laughs> that is Murphy's law. Yeah, so no text message I've gotten through. Is anybody from A1 here who's, who's configuring the network as, as we do this? <laughs> hmm. So I, of course, have to change it uh, over to the, the other key now, um, since I'm filtering everything that's not encrypted under the key. Hmm. Curious by which, uh, by what that's determined, how, how often it changes. Because get, yesterday it was it was stable for hours. So, more text messages, please. Yeah, we got something. Okay, so um, the, da the data as it's being shown here in Wireshark is what, uh, uh, what the air probe tool um, manages to decode. Um, it will spit out the, the decoded packages on the command line 
but it also will forward it on a local interface so Wireshark can, can fetch it uh, from there. And since I'm only decrypting stuff that's sent to this key, so I'm assuming that this is a text message for my phone and it says, It says, <laughs> come on, let's listen. Can you read this? Yeah, we can. So, um, this is just a, a, a tiny peek into, uh, um, in, into what the GSM tools today are capable of. So, I think it's, it's fair to say that we, that we picked up GSMA's challenge, and yes, we now have a, what did I say, a radio receiving system being the USRP, and a signal processing software, being the air probe, that does everything we need to, to, to leverage the capability of, of cracking keys. Um, intentionally, I didn't send a text message, but rather I wanted to receive one, since the other direction is still very hard. And uh, we, we'll, we'll now discuss why, why the signaling um, exercise is hard and specifically so on the data the phone sends to the base station. Um, so first a couple of basics. Um, you saw that there were a couple of packets we were actually capturing, one of which was the text message. All these packets, they belong to a transaction. Um, so GSM is fairly complex protocol wise, even for simple things like sending over 160 characters of text message. And beyond those messages we saw in Wireshark, there's a couple of more that are that are needed to, to get the, the text message um, to the phone. So um, what would we see if we, if we captured all the channels, or what does the phone see um, while, while, say, it's, it's receiving a call? The phone will first be, be paged, pinged, basically, um, on, a, on a broadcast channel. Phone usually listens to this channel, and uh, the, the base station that thinks from a past transaction um, that the phone is within its vicinity will, when, when receiving a call, first query whether that's still the case. So it will, it will send out a ping and ask the phone, um, hey, are you still there? Um, it will page it, right? Um, the phone will, if still in, in the reach of the cell, say, yes, I'm still reachable here. And so not to, to, to pollute this, this broadcast channel any further with the actual transaction, the base station will then request the phone to switch over to another channel. So I'll say in this case uh, of the cell we, we just looked at, please switch over to another time slot on this frequency because only this one time slot is reserved for broadcast and we need this to page other phones. So they're, sw they're all switching over to, to what's known as, a, as an SDCCH, a controlled channel. On this control channel, again, they have to communicate uh, unencrypted at first, since it's not even um, known yet what, what key they would use and all that. Um, so the first thing that's usually happening on a control channel is um, the base station and the phone agree upon a key. Or if they've previously already agreed upon a key, they'll, they'll agree to now use that key for every further packet. So, and that is controlled by the base station. And um, in, in Western countries, you should expect base stations to, to say, please now start encrypting so that your call, your text message um, are protected. The phone will acknowledge all of this um, and only now that, that, they are, um, that they are communicating over an encrypted channel, the phone will be told what's actually happening currently. So far, um, the phone just did what the base station wanted it and it doesn't know, is it gonna receive a text message, is there a phone call, is there anything else? So now the the base station will send um, the information, hey, there is a call waiting for you. Um, please, please get ready to, to, uh, to take this call. And for instance, in this packet, um, you'll see the, the caller ID, right? Now call ID is the first piece of really private information that's being communicated here. Who calls whom is supposed to be private? And sure enough, it, it is encrypted, right? Phone acknowledges this and um, again is asked to switch to another channel. Um, this SDCCH2 is, um, is supposed to be kept free for, for other phones, of course, to, to do these exercises. So the, the traffic, the actual voice call, um, is moved to yet another channel. Or 
as is very common in GSM, to a series of channels that are used one after another. So there'll be a sequence of channels um, that are used for, for, uh, for sequential packets, right? So it will use a channel, I don't know, this, this cell, for instance, um, operates on, on channel 51 times slot zero is this, 51, uh, 51 times slot one is the control channel, and then the traffic channels are somewhere between 950 and um, 1,000 something, right? Um, maybe 1,020. Um, and it will, it will be a couple of them, um, if, if configured well. Now, with this cell, that's not the case, but let's, let's assume they, they actually did configure security. So this could be something like go to channel 900 and then go to channel 1,000, and then go to channel 900 and go to channel 1,000. So the phone keeps hopping through the spectrum, right? This was an initially meant for, um, to, to improve um, noise resistance. If there's a, a very noisy signal on one of these frequencies and, and all the packets get canceled out, there's typically enough information left from all the other channels to puzzle together the, the, the voice call anyway, right? Now, this has recently become a security feature, apparently. And it does increase the, the complexity of capturing this data. Now, we can easily capture this channel 51, and that's what I just did, since the text messages are being sent um, here and then the, the conversation is over. I cannot easily capture channel, channel 51 and every other channel that could be used during a phone conversation, right? These are not predetermined, and the, num the, the sequence of channels to be used for this specific phone call is communicated in an encrypted message. So unless I have a key cracking capability that allows me to crack this message basically in a, in a millisecond before, before they switch over and start hopping, I don't know what, where they will be hopping to. And I'll definitely lose as much packets uh, as are being sent while I'm still cracking the key and trying to figure out uh, what the hopping sequence is, right? So the signal processing um, difficulty come from having to cover um, a large chunk of spectrum unless you're able to, to kind of predetermine the secretly agreed upon hopping sequence. Um, the, the GSM spectrum is, is divided in, in many ways. Um, the, the, the spectrum itself is fairly large and the, the GSM 900 band shown here is actually the, the, the smaller of the two. The, the 1800 band um, is, is, is much, much larger, and larger in frequency yet. But let's focus on this 900 band um, that we were um, just analyzing. Um, first of all, of course, it's, it's divided uh, in frequency um, for, for communication to the phone. It's called downlink and for communication from the phone. It's called uplink. Um, so these are strictly separate. They are tied together though. So a frequency up here for the downlink will be, uh, will be associated with a frequency, with a fixed offset um, so that the, the base station and the, um, the phone are always uh, hopping in sequence um, for, for, their, for, their sending, um, for the sending frequencies. Now this, this spectrum, first of all, is, is divided by operators. Um, in, in Austria, there's three operators, um, and they have varying chunks of the spectrum. There's some, some operators more focused on the 900 megahertz band, some operators more focused on the 1800 megahertz band. But there's four? Who's the fourth? Um, well, the, the ones that, that Wikipedia tells me exist, let me, let me pull out this. What's Hutch? I don't think Hutch has their own frequencies. They, they'll be sharing some frequencies. They only have 3G networks. Okay, well, okay, 3G, completely different story, yeah. Okay, oh, interesting. So there's somebody who's actually guaranteed to have 3G calls. Huh, no? Oh, okay, well, never mind. I thought I was some, some hope for, for guaranteed security. Um, 
So in any event, um, the, the, the A1 operator that, that my phone um, that my phone likes to roam with apparently um, has, has two big chunks of, of the 900 megahertz band. They are disjoint, um, maybe for, 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 for auction reasons that, that, that these different blocks were auctioned off, maybe though for signal propagation reasons, that they want to be as noise resistant as possible, so it's good to have, to have frequencies as, at both ends of the spectrum. So for whatever reason they got assigned these frequencies, they are, um, they, they are spread over, uh, over the 900 megahertz band. And then off these big chunks of spectrum, they allocate um, a few channels, called Afghans, um, a few channels to every cell. So the cell that's, that's operating um, here that my phone's currently connected to, let's see how many channels it got. Um, Ooh. Well, I guess it's not disclosing its hopping channels. Um, but yeah, it, it, it only has um, one channel up here from, from, from what I could figure out. Oh yeah, exactly this, this one, the, the 51. And then it has a couple of channels on the other end of the spectrum where it can hop to or uh, where, it, where it could potentially build a hopping sequence from which this cell isn't doing. And then any one particular call, as we just saw, gets yet a subset of those, right? It definitely starts off at the 51, since that's the beacon channel and the signaling channel, but then it will jump somewhere else, right? Like the 1010 or whatever, right? So the requirements for, 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 for um, debugging this kind of stuff are vastly different depending on whether you want to debug a single phone call or whether you want to suck down all the data that's coming out of a cell or perhaps even all the data that's transmitted within a certain operator's allocation, or perhaps even capture everything that's transmitted over GSM ever. Right? And depending on your requirements, you'll, you'll need uh, very different equipment. Um, starting off was, was an equipment that, that we, that we uh, saw demonstrated yesterday for the first time, and I'm very excited that this now uh, has become open source. Um, a modified phone, right? Um, a phone is supposed to receive GSM signals, decode them very well in cheap hardware, so it, it should be the perfect sniffing device. However, a phone, of course, is only supposed to, to capture one channel at a time, its channel, right? So it can hop very fast among the channels, but only one at a time. If your, um, let's say, debugging subject um, it's just exactly one phone call that maybe you even know the hopping sequence for. One phone is, is plenty sufficient. If your debugging subject is a cell like the one outside here that's configured in a way where it kind of uses the same channels over and over again for various calls, maybe from a set of four or five, then those five, can be, five channels can be captured with five phones and that's it. That's probably all you need to capture an entire cell here, not just one call, because it's, again, undetermined where somebody will be hopping to, but all calls on this one cell. And one of these phones will cost you 15 euros, right? So even putting together 10 or 20 of them, um, doubling up because you want to get the uplink frequencies at the same time too, uh, will still stay within a fairly limited budget, right? So that's kind of the, the, the entry to, um, to GSM debugging. Um, if you know what you're looking for, if you know what frequencies are interesting, that's probably the way to go. Uh, it's also um, extremely easy to configure with, with the tool set Sylvain, um, I think already committed to the Osmo ComBB uh, repository. Um, one step up from there are, are these devices. As I was saying, they are not, they're not specifically meant for GSM, so they're, they're certainly not limited to, to one channel at a time. Um, in fact, uh, the radio capabilities on these um, are, um, are capable of, of sniffing huge chunks of, of spectrum. This one is limited by its connection. It has a USB interface to the computer, um, and it can only, of course, push over uh, as much data as goes over USB. So a USLP1 will capture you eight megahertz of spectrum. Um, that is, what, what's, what's the spacing of the channels? 
but they're, they're really all used, potentially. Now, what's, the, what's the maximum packing of channels? Every other channel. Every other channel. So we have, um, we have two and a half to the megahertz. Um, yeah, so you get some, something like 20, 20 adjacent channels with this, instead of just one with the phone. But maybe those 20 channels only include one that's really interesting to you. So um, this now goes more into white band sniffing, where you're not interested in one particular cell or one particular phone call, but rather in GSM in general. If you want to derive statistics over how different cells behave, um, this is a great device. There's a, there's a big brother to this device um, whose, whose radio front ends are very similar. So it kind of captures the same chunks of spectrum. However, its connectivity to the outside world is in gigabit Ethernet interface now, called the USRP2. And um, that easily captures 20 megahertz, prob probably more if you, um, if you have a very stable daughter bot that doesn't fall off on, on the edges too, too badly. Um, so with... Um, with two of these USRP 2s you can already capture everything GSM 5, uh, 900 in one direction. So with four of them, you cover really everything. Every phone call that's going on in your vicinity, uplink and downlink from every cell of every operator. Right? And that's a capability, of course, that, that um, not necessarily law enforcement, but more intelligence op operations, embassies, these kind of people uh, have been wanting for a long time. And they did build this for a long time. Uh, it comes in the form of, of, of very custom um, FPGA boards that are basically the same idea as this, but just um, scaled up by, by, by an order of magnitude um, with, with parallel, very fast, um, AD converters and a much bigger FPGA than what's on here. And in fact, a lot of the, a lot of the, the processing that AirProp does um, in software, in these devices, it's realized in hardware on the FPGA. So there's boards you can, you can buy, um, they'll, they'll run you up to say 100,000 euros. Um, they'll capture everything GSM and process it, it nicely into bits and bytes and, and just give you the, the limited decoded data streams into your computer, right? Um, nice devices, but clearly too expensive. So with, with this stuff um, over here, we're talking something like uh, 700 or 1,000 euros. Um, and that's much more uh, tangible, hence um, we are focusing in our analysis uh, on, on I mean, increasing the capabilities of exactly these devices. And as, there be, as they are widespread in the community already for, for other projects that built up upon them, we hope to be contributing um, to some other people's research with this. But yeah, long story short, um, these devices um, do, um, do, do sniff downlink. Um, I think we've already uh, demonstrated this. I moved this, this, this up front so you saw how, how this captured the text message that was, was sent to us, which, and then the air probe would, would decode it and, um, and, and show you the, the, the process data, right? Uh, Wireshark has been, has been increased um, capabilities to, to decode everything that, that actually should be sent over GSM. Um, now, downlink sniffing has, has been working for a while now. Uh, oops. Um, and let me jump over this slide and come back to it later when we talk about actual key cracking. I don't want to um, get, get to details part and um, why uplink sniffing, um, meaning also capturing a text message that would be sent from this phone or capturing the second half of a phone conversation because that's always uplink and downlink um, at the same time, of course, why that is much harder, but um, can also be, be, be targeted with this uh, device. So take it away from that. So, sorry. Um, downlink uh, sniffing or receiving the downlink is uh, not that much a problem. Of course, uh, the operators want that you receive their cells. The antennas uh, are on high buildings or on masts, 
Um, so you can receive a cell quite easily on a huge range, up to five kilometers or even 35 kilometers on rural areas. 35 uh, kilometers is also the maximum range of a standard cell. However, for uplink, it's uh, different. Um, the goal is not uh, that you receive the phone in the whole coverage area, of course. It's only the goal that the BTS can receive the phone. So if the BTS can receive the phone, it's good for it. Uh, but uh, someone who is going to intercept or uh, listen to the calls uh, could be at a totally different position. So it's uh, quite hard to receive uh, the signal of a phone if you are too far away. Um, usually you have a range of several hundred meters if you are on uh, the ground and want to receive a different phone. The reasons for this is um, the signal is uh, usually uh, not that strong. Um, the intention is the BTS uh, sees the signal of the phone and it tells the phone uh, to send at a certain power level. If the power level is good enough at the BTS, it says, okay, it's fine for me. If it's rather strong, it tells the phone, you can use even a smaller power uh, to send to me because I still can receive you. The benefit of this is um, that the battery life of the phone is extended. It does not need uh, that much power if you send with lower RF output. Uh, another problem for receiving an uplink phone is that the phone can be between buildings. It can even move. If you are in a car, drive around in a, a city with huge buildings, the signal varies quite a lot. You have a varying signal, you have this uh, power control from the BTS, and this makes it quite hard for an uplink sniffer. Um, what you can do against this is um, you use a directional antenna, you can use an LNA, uh, this is a low noise amplifier in front of your receiver. Uh, this can make it uh, easier to receive the, uh, the uplink channel of the phone. So uh, what we started to implement uh, some first experiments for uplink sniffing in AirProbe. Um, it's not yet uh, complete ready for a release, but we are very close. Um, what we did so far is we used the USAP-1. The USAP-1 um, has the advantage that you can put in two different daughter boards, and you need them to receive uplink and downlink at the same time. Carsten already mentioned it, the difference between uplink and downlink is uh, a uh, fixed amount of frequency for GSM 900, we have um, 45 megahertz. For GSM 1800, it's even much more. It's 95 megahertz, and you can't receive this with a single board. Um, so you need two of them, and only the USAP-1 is capable to, uh, that you can plug in two different boards. If you want to do the same thing with the USAP, you need uh, two units. Um, if you wonder what those uh, diagrams are, um, this is the power, as you can see it, on the air uh, of an SMS uh, sent to the BTS. Each of those spikes um, consists actually of four bursts. Four bursts make up one message. So every spike on the first uh, picture is one message sent from the phone uh, to the BTS. Um, I, will do a, I will do a, sh a short demo now. and. Uh, show you um, how this looks like in AirPro. I just need a different computer. I have started Wireshark again. In this case, uh, in this demonstration, I take pre-recorded uh, capture files. Those recordings were made with the USAP-1. Um, it was an SMS sent to OpenBSC, to our open source uh, GSM network, and encryption was turned on. Um, <clears throat> I use AirProbe to offline um, decode those pre-recorded messages. I will start 
air curb here. This is actually a rather old and slow computer, but it has the benefit that you see the messages slowly coming in. Slowly. Uh, it's not useful, of course, for real-time catching, uh, but for demonstration it's quite nice. It's not intentionally delayed, it's simply because it's so slow. It's the signal processing part, which takes quite some power uh, to process on a modern computer, actually no problem. Several years old, it's a problem. Um, what you see here is uh, the first part, unencrypted, which you can uh, decode without knowing the key. What you see is uh, the phone is telling the BTS that it wants to send an SMS. This is the service request message some measurement reports, something going up and down. The red, uh, I didn't mention it, the red thing is the uplink. The blue one is what is sent from the BTS to the phone, red is from the phone to the BTS. The interesting thing uh, starts here. This is the silvering command. This is where the BTS tells the phone to turn on silvering. At this point, A51 is turned on, encryption is turned on, and you see here, that um, A51, <coughs> A51 encryption algorithm is used. From now on, you usually cannot uh, read anything more because you need the encryption key. At this point, Kraken comes in, which will demonstrate it by Carsten later, and Kraken can be used uh, with some known text to find out the key. In our case, I know the key, and I now start restart um, AirProbe again using this known uh, key and it will decrypt now all the messages which are coming after turning on the encryption. Again, slow. But okay, um, we now see the rest of the messages which were actually encrypted. The interesting thing here, uh, some notification ciphering has been turned on and here again is our, just wait, I will stop it. We have what we need. Here's our uplink SMS in this case. The SMS text is not contained in any downlink frame because actually an SMS was sent from the phone to the BTS. Yeah, and again. We have our text. Uh, as I said, it's just a demonstration with pre-recorded data, but uh, it's some fiddling uh, required regarding the power. But actually, yes, uh, we can uh, sniff uplink traffic, and it's expected to be released in, let's say, the next uh, three or four weeks. OK, so far for the demo. Um, well, thanks for the moderation. I, I would take questions anyway now because. Um, <laughs> um, so as 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 Dita, as Dita was saying, it's it's, it's still uh, uplink sniffing is is not completely stable, not not as stable as the downlink sniffing, where I just plug it in and suck down everything from the spectrum. But it works. It has been shown to work now, um, and it's it's being it's it's being improved. Um, are there any questions on, on uplink sniffing or any of the, the things we've covered so far? Um, short of that, I would want um, would want to uh, talk a little bit about key cracking and why, why it is possible. So uh, let's actually show how, how easy key cracking is by now. Um, 
there's, um, there's this tool called Kraken um, that uh, was fed with the rainbow tables. We, we said we would compute um, last year at, uh, at DeepSec, which have been computed in the meantime, which have been put on BitTorrent in the meantime, which have been shipped roughly 100 times all over the world. It's a two terabyte uh, hard disk that we're shipping everywhere. So it's a widely spread tool now um, that eats A51 keystream and spits out keys. So um, for the message that, messages that Dita just showed, the uplink messages, um, we, um, we extracted the, the following um, keystream. So now this is, if you don't yet know the, 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 the correct key, if you had recorded the, the, um, the C file with the USRP that Dita showed um, and you wanted to decrypt it now, uh, short of owning the phone and just can look up the, the key. All you do is um, take a guess of what message was sent, and there's 41, at least something like 30 of them are predetermined and completely deterministic. So take a guess at where one of these was. You, um, you'll, you, you compute what, what data then was used to, to encrypt it to be in this form over the air, and you feed that, um, the XO of the two, oops, um, into this Kraken monster. Um, and it will now try to, to look up every 64-bit segment in this key stream in 40 tables. There's something like 15,000 lookups in each of the tables. So it's, it's massive stuff going on in the background. Um, but it's nicely abstracted away. And um, I usually get lucky and I crack it on, on the first burst, which statistically shouldn't be possible, but it's been like this every time so far. And the same here. So it, it just found two, two possible keys. There's a lot of non nonlinearism in, in A51, so not every possible key actually is the right key. But to verify that, that these two keys are, um, are actually what we, what we want, we can verify it with a second chunk of data. So there's, a, um, there's, there's this key we found at this position um, in this frame. So to verify that it actually uh, is the right decryption key, we give it a second frame. Um, so you can check whether that too would be decrypted correctly. And in fact, the key that Dita typed in does match. So um, if you had recorded your neighbor's uplink, um, this will be the tool to now allow you to, um, to read the, the encrypted parts as well, right? Short discussion on why this is possible. Um, I was saying that, that we feed the Kraken with um, information that was partly guessed, where we say, okay, we expect this message to always occur at this stage of the, of the setup phase, so it must be encrypted with that and that information, and boom, we get enough information to, to feed Kraken. Now, it doesn't need to be the case that these 30 or so messages are predictable in GSM. In fact, the, the GSMA, um, the umbrella organization that, that kind of owns the standards, um, they specified almost three years ago that um, every packet should be randomized, that no packet in GSM, if at all possible, should be predictable. And um, the standard amendment um, that they did in 2008 um, calls for all the, the padding, the stuff shown in red here, um, to, the padding that's now predictable at the, um, at the byte to be, to be uh, replaced with random numbers. So in this sniff, this is from another conversation, but it had basically has the, the, same, the same setup messages in it, just downlink um, every, uh, every message that contains any part of red um, would not be crackable anymore. Now that in this example only leaves two messages, and uh, we were discussing this in length during the GSM training two days ago. Um, these messages too could be randomized. However, there's no standard for that yet. So big step forward, putting all the, all the existing key crackers out of the market will be randomized those downlink messages. Next step, very crucial, also randomize the remaining messages, the system information message. Finally, after today, Third step, randomize what's coming up from the phone, right? The phones, too, send predictable information, and the phones, too, use this stupid predictable padding byte. 
So there's a lot of work ahead for the, for the GSMA, but at least there is a, um, a determined path to, to, to much more security in GSM without changing the crypto function we put checked over this past year. With that, I hope we've, we've given you some, some material for thought, some tools you could be using, the, the air probe in particular, with soon patches to, to also sniff uplink. And um, yeah, thanks, thanks for your attention. Thanks for the good timing. And we have one minute for one question, and then we have to switch to the next talk. But maybe we can, yeah. Um, with the patch, with randomized bedding uh, being so easy, do you think operators really want to secure that net, their network, or do they just don't care? Um, I think they would want to secure it if it's not very costly. Um, they got to understand that this isn't very costly, right, first of all, and I don't think that's, that's quite understood yet. And they got to understand what, what, what large of an effect this could have. Since a few years ago, they had the discussion of what can we do to make our networks more secure? And they were told you can spend X billion dollars to upgrade all the equipment to do better encryption function, or you stay insecure. So back then, they kind of choose insecure, and they're staying with it. The fact that now with a little software patch, is one line of code at a random number, right? Um, they could gain much security. I think this is, this is unknown to a lot of operators. However, some are implementing this right now. So the first operator, close to here actually, um, will, will have this by the end of the year. And you don't have to patch the phone for it to be... Now, for all, all phones are compatible with it. Of course, if you patch the base station, it only applies to, to all the data that's coming down. So if somebody like Dita with this directed antenna and with this super duper air probe sniffs your uplink data, that needs to be patched too.